Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us again for another Barometer webcast. My name is Pamela Hastings, Relationship Manager here at Barometer Capital, and today we will provide you with a brief macro overview and allow David to speak to the potential, we, we recently spoke about the potential bumpiness into U.S. Thanksgiving. We are now staring down at U.S. Thanksgiving. The turkeys are running uh, away from everyone who's trying to capture them to eat them. And of course, uh, David, we will look forward to hearing your thoughts and how um, this bumpiness is uh, currently impacting investors. As always, we're happy to address your questions on this call and we will do so at the tail end of it. So please don't be shy. You can email me at phastings at barometercapital.ca or hit me up on the chat via Zoom. And with that, as always, I turn the conversation to David Burroughs, our Chief Investment Strategist and President at Barometer. Good afternoon, David. Hi, Pam. How are you? You ready for Thanksgiving? Yes, we're all ready. I think we're having steak, though, <laughs> not turkey. <laughs> You're such a traditionalist. Yes, always. <laughs> well, thanks. Thanks very much for uh, for coming on today. Uh, thanks, everybody, for joining us. Uh, it's uh, it's an interesting day to talk. Uh, last uh, couple of weeks have been interesting in markets. We talked uh, over the last few weeks about the fact that you get into November and you certainly have seasonality on your side. Uh, sort of from about the middle of October until April. Uh, two weeks ago, uh, we talked about the fact that you do often see some bumpiness in the week or 10 days leading into Thanksgiving for, for a bunch of different reasons. Uh, there tends to be some tax loss selling for those that have some losses. And believe it or not, there are you know, uh, lots of companies not doing particularly well. Last Friday, there were 400 new lows in the NASDAQ, which has happened really only 25 times in the last 50 years. Um, and so that's interesting. You also have hedge funds squaring up their positions uh, for their fiscal year ends. Uh, in some cases, wanting to lock in their returns for the year. So there's some selling that comes out of that. And then there's just generally people who are away leading into the holiday. So the, vol the, uh, the liquidity is not quite as good. So we're gonna talk a little bit about that today and, and how it may be impacting us, what, what maybe we've been doing over the last couple of weeks and how we're positioned. Uh, against what kind of what's going on. So just, just quickly, uh, we always start with the macro and our baseline view is that we're in a structural bull market in equities globally. Uh, US was the first bull market starting in 2013, taking out the highs from 2000. Uh, and since then it's been kind of four steps forward, one step back. Certainly there have been corrections along the way, uh, but uh, we're, we're into it now for about eight years and they they can be you know 15 16 19 years long they can go on for a long time so we don't want to get too wound up with the fact that the market's been making new highs because in a structural bull market you continue to make new all-time highs all the way through the piece we've also had a view that we were going through a bottoming process in global yields much like we did back in the late 1940s early 1950s moving from a disinflationary world to a reflationary world. And part of that will include bouts of inflation, but inflation in asset prices, making it important to own assets, productive assets that have an ability to raise price, which means that maybe some of the things that do well in a reflationary world are different than things that do well in a disinflationary world. Uh, so we're gonna talk a little bit more about that this week also had a view that we were going through uh, uh, a secular or structural bottom in the commodities markets uh, and the disinflationary impact of falling commodity prices might move into a more inflationary impact uh, going forward. This was a chart that was uh, back from uh, the end of 2020. And if we bring it up to today, we're looking at rolling 10-year returns. The rolling 10-year returns for commodities uh, went from uh, 18 months ago at almost 7% negative returns per year for the previous 10 years to now up and through the break even level. But it won't be over until we get to 15 or 20% 10 year returns uh, going forward. So, uh, you know, once it starts, it can go on for a very, very long time. Uh, so let's just check in with some of our major themes. This is the S&P starting from the corrective period in October, November of 2020. 
uh, it's been, been a very steady advancing channel. We corrected uh, in August and September and almost on cue from a, from a, a seasonal perspective, market found a bottom and started to work its way higher. And, you know, just as of yesterday, the S&P 500 made a new high. It can be a little bit deceiving sometimes looking at the S&P because we know that it is dominated by seven or eight giants uh, and that underlying within the 500 companies, there are lots of companies that mean very little to the index and can move around a lot without having a big impact. But certainly the index uh, has been consolidating here over about the last 12 or 14 trading days which would also make sense given some of the seasonality. Now, <clears throat> the seasonality uh, from November really through April is that markets tend to be quite strong if we go back to 1950, and that is the case. But again, they don't go straight higher. We talked about the fact that when you go through sort of the middle of November leading up to, uh, leading up to Thanksgiving, you often have some bumpiness. We should be sort of getting through that. But we see, have seen some bumpiness in different parts of the market. We'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, when you look at the NASDAQ, NASDAQ's actually had a sharper pullback over the last couple of days. This is NASDAQ 100. Um, and as I mentioned, the NASDAQ composite had 400 new lows for the year on Friday. So certainly lots of stocks selling off within them, but there's some strong stocks and some weak ones. And we don't have to be everywhere. Our job's to target strength. Uh, and I think in general, our positions have been hanging in pretty well. We'll talk about that. This is the Russell 2000 that broke out of this large base <clears throat> back at the end of October. It's come back in and retesting that breakout, which often happens, but it's had about two weeks uh, of broad-based weakness. And so that's something just to keep an eye on and, and, and look at where the weakness is coming. Um, we're headed into seasonally strong period, as we talked about in the, in the Russell 2000. But again, if you look at it historically, there's some bumpiness coming through into the end of October and sometimes in the end of December. Uh, the structural bull market has been going on now for about uh, just about 3,100 days versus the bull market of the 80s and 90s, which was 7,700 days. So uh, potentially we have a long way to go. We'll see. And the return so far has been about 585% versus about 1,500% in the 80s and 90s. So again, uh, could well be that we've got a long way to go, but we'll just have to continue to assess it day by day based on the models that we use. When we looked at breadth in the S&P and uh, in the, in the NYSE as a whole last week, we saw that the percent of stocks in uptrends you know, had been fairly steadily advancing. Uh, that we're seeing some improvement in Canada as well. Our short-term indicators were all positive. When we look at our same indicators today, the long-term indicator continues to be solid. The long-term indicator for Canada continues to be solid, but we have seen a pullback in the percent of stocks trading above their 50-day moving average. We've seen a pullback in the percent of stocks with positive weekly price momentum or upward trajectory. We've seen a pullback in the number of stocks making new highs versus new lows. And we've seen a pullback in the percent of stocks trading above their long-term moving average, 150-day moving average. So these four short-term indicators tell us to be a little bit more cautious and really to scrutinize the holdings that we have. Now, things don't all move together, and that's the reason we track breadth. Generally, the weakest securities sell off first. And then if weakness persists, it will come back and get the stronger securities so we track each one of our positions daily, each one of the sectors that we follow daily to make sure that the leadership groups we're focused in and the leaders within those leadership groups continue to behave the way that they should given what we think we know. If they don't, we use our stop losses to exit or reduce our exposure. When our indicators are weakening, we don't tend to put on any new positions. And if our stop losses get hit, the cash position builds. So we're always interested to watch these indicators because it gives us a sense for whether money is getting put to work, whether money is being taken out of the market. So let's go back and check our leadership teams. <clears throat> As you know, we're not trying to be everywhere. We're trying to focus on those key areas of the market that have some structural tailwind. And we've been in all kinds of big structural themes over the last 18 months. And if we continue to be in a bull market, leadership tends to persist Along the way, late stages, maybe weakling groups start to perform a little better. That doesn't mean they are taking over new leadership. They're just being additive. 
So we're always watching for new leadership to emerge. And we're, and we're always prepared to go to the sidelines if our group's themes start to fail. So this is an empirical process. It's not about an opinion as to what should happen. It's about measuring what is happening and having a tactical process to make changes in the portfolio when they're required. Okay, so let's look at what is happening. From a fixed income perspective, and we've been talking about the fact that we thought the fixed income markets were under some pressure of rising rates. You can see very clearly, this is the IEF, it's an ETF of seven to 10 year US treasury bonds. They sold off sharply <coughs> into the spring of 2021. They bounced and consolidated. They were unable to make higher highs and failed. And here we are today, trading basically back at lows. So the market is assessing that, that, for, that the future interest rates are going to be higher. And there is some money leaving the bond market with the view that perhaps driven this week by the fact that uh, we had a, a, reaffirmation, a reaffirmation of Fed chair uh, and that uh, uh, Brainerd was not made the chair of the Fed, um, that in fact, um, uh, things may be a little bit more hawkish going forward. And so bond market reacted. Now that's the US Treasury market. It's the broadest, deepest bond market in the world, but it has not been held only to the US bond market. We also saw weakness in other, in other bond markets. So for instance, uh, this is uh, the shorter to intermediate term US Treasuries, okay, actually made a lower low. When we look at um, the emerging market debt, emerging market debt really making a lower low. So this has really been quite a waterfall since the beginning of the year, very significant decline. Uh, we also have had some weakness uh, in uh, global treasury debt. Okay, some difficulty. So this is, uh, international treasury bonds. So this is sovereign debt of other world uh, uh, centers. So bonds globally have continued to weaken. Now we've talked a lot about inflation and the risk of inflation. We've also talked about the fact that bond yields can go higher when there's an expectation there could be higher growth going forward. And we don't always know what's driving things, but we try and understand it. So when I look now at groups that should act like bonds, <clears throat> the IYZ is the ETF of telecommunications. So a bond is a long duration asset. Uh, it uh, yields um, as they go higher are reflecting what people think longer term. If you own a company that is consistent but unable to raise price and bond yields go higher, then share prices go lower. And so telecommunication stocks have been particularly weak. When we look at other areas that also would be impacted, for instance, high dividend paying <clears throat> global stocks, these are not companies with growing dividends, but high dividends, again, making new lows this week. So <clears throat> market continues to confirm the view that we're in a reflationary environment and things that get negatively impacted by higher rates are underperforming. So moving beyond there, let's talk about other things that get hurt by higher rates. If you have a company with very low earnings, that expectation that in the very long term that they will grow, in other words, they trade at high multiples of current earnings. Uh, if rates go higher, it makes earnings out way out in the future worth a lot less. So this is the ARKK ETF. It's uh, one of Kathy Wood's uh, biggest ETFs invested in the most sort of futuristic technologies, those companies where earnings are on the come. The ARKK had a very difficult week and is trading at multi-month lows. And now really since the beginning of the year, down sharply since the beginning of the year. And this would include you know, companies like uh, Zoom and Peloton, but it would include some of the uh, uh, real early stage uh, artificial intelligence companies and early stage cloud companies. 
And again, there's a, there's a differentiator between companies that should have earnings in the future and the leaders that today have earnings and cash flow, and they're trading much differently one from the other. So software, again, <clears throat> this is an unweighted index of software companies. When people sign up for a software contract, they sign up for a set price for many, many months or years. Uh, again, prices don't rise when inflation rises. So if inflation rises or rates rise, something with a long tail of recurring revenue looks less attractive. And they closed at new lows today. So there are a number of sort of high multiple areas of the market that are under some pressure. We include in those <clears throat> uh, online retail. And we know that online retail continues to grow, but really there was a frenzy in buying around online retail in February, March of last year. Again, taking out this week lows from both May and October and breaking to the downside. So quite significant damage in some of these companies uh, and something that we definitely have to keep an eye on. We also have seen weakness in online payment companies, <clears throat> companies like Square, uh, but also companies like Visa and MasterCard, higher multiple companies uh, that have a very difficult time raising price. So there are areas of weakness in equities and, and looking at these charts, you know, it, it would be concerning if you thought this was what happening across the market. We look at biotech, biotech also, you're buying future earnings. They may not have earnings today. They may be investing in the technology, <clears throat> but the earnings are on the come. Same thing, very difficult year so far. And I've watched this week as countless biotech pharmaceutical companies and medical device companies have really been under pressure. So there are areas of weakness in this market and things that we have to be kind of careful about. What's really important though, is that correlations or the degree to which stocks are behaving the same as one another is falling. So what does that mean? It means the market's acting like a sorting hat. Given all of the major influences on the market today, some companies will be impacted more than others. And what we're seeing is the market is sorting the good from the bad. When correlations go up as they did in January, February, 2020, it means there's some macro event that's impacting everything. That's not healthy. When correlations are falling, it means there's no big macro concern, but some companies are being seen favorably and some companies are being seen negatively. That means there's an opportunity as a active tactical manager, which is really our bailiwick. So let's look at some of our key leadership themes. Let's start with banks. The largest weight that we have in our portfolios across the firm are financials. Banks would be a big part of it. This is the KBE Bank ETF, closed virtually at new highs today, <clears throat> uh, being helped by many, many banks. Uh, lots, of, lots of great performance in some of the big names that were in the US, Silicon Valley Bank Corp, First Republic, uh, even Morgan Stanley and Goldman Sachs behaving well in Canada, National Bank Financial trading virtually at a new all-time high. Uh, why are these behaving well against rising interest rates? Rising interest rates are good for banks. If there's reflation in the economy or asset prices are going up, the value of the collateral that they hold to make loans against is going up, it means their balance sheets are becoming safer. And frankly, <clears throat> they're generating very strong free cash flow and raising dividends and buying back shares. Now, it's not just banks within finances that are performing well, as we've talked about, asset managers continue to do well. This is Blackstone, one of the biggest asset managers in the world. Uh, uh, very, very successful in private equity. Uh, and, uh, you know, we've talked about investors group in Canada. We've talked about CI. All of them continue to act quite well. So financials <clears throat> really unimpacted by the volatility we're seeing in some of those high multiple stocks. Let's go beyond financials. Let's talk about <clears throat> uh, technology. Now, within technology, we've seen some areas are weak. But we've talked about the fact that there are areas of technology that are more reflationary, specifically semiconductors. Uh, the companies that make equipment, uh, the, the newer technologies to move to the next generation of chips, companies like LAM Research and Applied Materials, having a very, very good month, uh, basically at new highs today. Uh, when we go beyond 
companies like Lamb Research, NVIDIA. We talked last week about looking forward to their earnings. They absolutely blew the doors off earnings and had a wonderful week. <clears throat> Continues to be about the biggest holding in the firm, uh, continuing to dominate artificial intelligence, cloud, gaming, uh, and, and importantly, crypto mining. So this group continues to act quite well. Um, outside of uh, semiconductors, you know, Apple basically trading at new highs <clears throat> continues to be strong. What's the difference in these companies versus the companies and sec parts of tech that are having a tough time? These companies have real earnings, real cash flows, are buying back shares, raising dividends, all of the things you want to see in reflation. Google also fits that camp. Okay, let's move beyond uh, technology. There's Microsoft, same same camp. You know, one day off highs. Uh, let's move on. Get the slides to advance. Okay, industrials. This is an ETF, PRN, which is a broad-based ETF made up of uh, unweighted holdings. So not two or three of the biggest companies having the biggest impact. They're all relatively about the same weight. These are companies within the industrial space, basically traded at a new high yesterday. No sign of weakness here. We're getting strength within the industrials in machinery, but we're also getting strength in, in the um, transports. Trucking companies and railroads had a good week this week. Bottlenecks seem to be clearing a little bit, but certainly pricing continues to be strong. You'll notice that all of these companies are companies that have an ability to raise price. Let's talk about energy. <clears throat> Lots of concern this week about uh, the Fed, sorry, uh, the, uh, the U.S. government opening up the strategic reserves, and that might impact oil prices negatively. They did pull back a little bit uh, coming into today. They announced today the opening of strategic reserves, and look what happened. The group rallied. So again, sort of sometimes it's buy the rumor, sell the news. So energy continues to act well. Again, an asset where price can rise quickly when input prices rise. Let's talk about commodities. No real sign of weakness here. This group has been consolidating over the last month. And this is an equally weighted basket of commodities. We've talked a lot about some of the metals. We've talked a lot about uh, agriculture. Agriculture continues to act well, closed at a new, the ETF for agriculture closed at new all-time highs today. This would include grains, et cetera. Uh, and then some of the companies feeding into the commodities themselves. Uh, Nutrien's a great example, fertilizer company, again, trading very close to new all-time highs. So these groups continue to perform well. Um, outside of <clears throat> some of the, some of the more common commodities, our job is to always be looking for new themes that are starting to show up. Uh, we do have a position in our macro portfolio in coffee. And you may be reading about the fact that coffee prices are going up at Starbucks. They're going up at Tim Hortons. Well, you own a little bit of uh, the coffee ETF uh, and, uh, and it's had a great week. So we're working hard at trying to offset some of your rising consumer costs. So all of these things are aimed at owning things that actually benefit from the current environment. Also within basic materials, uh, home construction materials moving higher. Uh, we're participating there with the uh, ETF ITB. We have some single name securities also within that group. <clears throat> and then sticking within the consumer group, uh, auto continues to be very strong, Ford making a new all time high yesterday. So, so far, key leadership themes that we've been focused on continuing to act well. We talked about how high dividend paying stocks are underperforming. Rising dividend growers are behaving really constructively. So we're seeing all kinds of dividend increases, all kinds of announcements of share buybacks, companies with strong growing free cash flow and an ability to raise price continue to behave really constructively and continue to behave well. I do a summary every morning in our morning meeting. One of the things I look at is all of the companies that have broken down in the previous day and the companies that have broken out. When we talked through our morning meeting this morning, groups that continue to strengthen through the course of this week, banks and financials, construction materials, chemicals, including lithium, solar, industrial, steel, forest, rail, trucking, grains, all things that have price move immediately 
uh, when there is supply demand problems. And on the other side, groups that have been accelerating to the downside, pharmaceuticals, biotech, medical equipment, healthcare, fintech and payments, internet, software, some of the high multiple tech with inability to raise price, travel and leisure, restaurants and gaming, some areas of consumer which arguably would be impacted by a new wave of COVID, communications, high dividend, bonds, emerging market debt and emerging market equities. So it's a real split market. And the, the, the important thing is to make sure that we're focused in areas of strength. Now, we continue to see increased discussion of inflation that's not going away. We need to make sure that our securities are behaving the way that they should be given what we think we know. It appears that they are. So when we look at positioning, Here's what's happening in our portfolios. We continue to have our largest weight in financials. It increased this week from 28% to 31%. That's about three times the S&P weight. Technology came down a little bit more this week in our portfolios, 19%. We're underweight technology, but our areas of technology are performing well. Our energy weight was down a snick over the course uh, of the last month but still about three times the weight of the S&P. Industrials continue to creep a little higher, highly economically sensitive, many of them able to raise price. Materials weightings continue to rise slowly. We have a little bit more in short-term government debt, a little bit of, little bit of cash. Uh, and then you can see our weightings in healthcare are next to nothing. Consumer discretionary quite low. Uh, communication services very low and utilities very low, consumer staples very low. So the portfolios as we sit today are reflationary portfolios, portfolios for the current environment. We have tailwinds, I think, in all of our various groups. Outside of the equity portfolios and income portfolios and our macro portfolio, we continue to have a weighting in crypt, uh, cryptocurrencies. Uh, Bitcoin as a currency surrogate for, for paper currency, you know, 60 years ago, currencies were backed by hard assets. Over the last 60 years, people have had comfort in currencies that were just plain backed by the full faith in the government. All central banks are printing money. I think lots of people have started to look at cryptocurrency, Bitcoin in particular, <clears throat> as uh, something that can't be printed. There will only ever be 21 million Bitcoin and when there was no alternative to paper currency, um, it was, should we own US dollars or Canadian dollars or euros or Aussie dollars or Japanese yen? Investors today have a choice of paper currency or an alternative, Bitcoin. And Bitcoin has performed really, really well over the course of the year. It's had a small pullback over the last week. Ether, same way, very small pullback over the course of the week but against uh, some tougher markets, certainly continuing to act really, really constructively. So we are into the strongest period of the year. We're just about at Thanksgiving, should be through the typical bumpiness into Thanksgiving. And we're gonna continue to assess things daily. But the net of it is this, if we look at the free cash flow yields that equities are generating, Okay, so the free cash flow margin on the S&P X technology is sitting here just above 8%. When we look at the, the free cash flow yield itself, not the margin, it's sitting at around 4%, X technology, just around 5%. So you have a choice as an investor, what type of asset to hold. You can own a bond, that yields somewhere between one and one and one and 1.6 percent, or you can own an equity that yields five. There's a reason why companies are buying back their shares. You're getting compensated well to take risk. If we go back to a time when equities are really expensive in 2000, the free cash flow yield on stocks was about two percent, and bond yields were about three percent. So stocks were expensive. That was the end of a bull market. Today, with a free cash flow yield of close to five against a bond yield on a 10-year of 
you're getting close to three times or a little bit more than three times the return for holding equities. And that's not lost on corporations. Corporations have announced record share buybacks. Why would they put the money into bonds when they could buy back shares that are yielding them three times as much? That's great for us as shareholders because the share count falls. Not only are they buying back shares, but they're paying out record dividends. So we think this can go on for a long time. Now, if you go back from 1996 to 2020, this is the seasonal pattern for flows into equity mutual funds. January generally sees more flows than all of the other months combined. And February comes right in behind. So we're sitting here coming into December when there tend to be year end flows uh, in November into equities. We're in a seasonally strong period. And this is taking all years back to 1996. But this year in particular, we're seeing very high share buybacks, very large number of dividend increases. There's probably more incentive for money to flow into equities than there have been in other years. Fixed income's been a negative returning asset over the course of the year. There certainly have to be some investors who are reconsidering their asset allocation. And in the beginning of the new year may choose to increase their equity weight and decrease their fixed income weight, given that it hasn't been working. So we think there's lots of reason to continue to own equities. We think that markets do look uh, attractive. Our key themes continue to work. And certainly if things were to get difficult, we'll take money and put it on the sidelines. <clears throat> but there's been a, almost $2 trillion went into bonds this year and they've given a negative return. There's about a trillion dollars went into, into equities, but since 2019 with the dip and then the recovery only about 445 billion there's room for this gap to close. Now, if things get difficult, we'll be happy to get defensive. We've shown in the past, we're always willing to do that. Uh, but at this point, I think that things continue to look pretty good. And uh, so we're steady as she goes. So with that, Pam, if there's any questions, certainly happy to answer them. Thanks so much, Dave. Yes, we have a question here, wondering what your favorite industrial stock is. <laughs> it's very difficult to say which favorite <laughs> company. Um, I'll say that there are, um, there are positions across industrials that look interesting. So I think that you have to keep an eye on the heavy equipment. So you have to keep an eye on a caterpillar and a deer. Uh, you have to keep an eye on some of the transports and certainly the rails in Canada look attractive. Um, when we look at, uh, some of the, um, some of the large diversified industrials, uh, companies like uh, uh, Textron and Honeywell look interesting. Um, or you can use that ETF PRN, which is gonna give you a basket, an unweighted basket of industrial companies. And I think that that might be a great way if you're looking for one name. Thanks so much, Dave. The next question comes from John and he's asking, what does Barometer consider renewable energy and um, and what are renewable energy and such companies as Brookfield Renewable or Northland Power? Are they what you would define as uti utilities or would you place them in the energy sector? Right. Um, do you hold or buy either Brookfield Renewable or Northland Power for Barometer clients? Um, so any any comments on that? definition okay. on how we would place those two companies would be helpful for John. Okay, so let's let's talk about that a little bit. We played renewable power in different ways. So uh, we own the, the TAN solar ETF, which is an ETF made up of companies that sell into the solar space. Companies like Solar Edge that makes uh, inverters, uh, companies that make solar panels themselves. Uh, we also uh, are invested in uh, the LIT, which is uh, lithium and battery technologies. Uh, that would be renewable power. Uh, we also have some exposure to uranium uh, and the URA. Now, they're all individual companies underlying here and all of them, all of them make sense. Our biggest weighting for renewable power would be Nextera Energy. 
and uh, Nextera Energy has uh, the largest contingent of uh, both solar and wind power for any uh, U.S. utility, and as a result, has a dividend growth rate, I think, in the 20% a year uh, category. So I think that that makes it look uh, particularly interesting. Now, um, if you look at Brookfield Renewable, uh, it's been an underperformer. And so I would be a little bit more cautious if you're in a bull market and you've got a company making new lows, uh, this is probably not the one you wanna be in. So, you know, you really have to pick your spots. Um, one of the ways that you can participate uh, in, um, in uh, alternative energy is there's, a, there's some global clean energy uh, ETFs, that's the ICLN. I think that the solar ETF looks better, uh, T-A-N. Uh, and then for single single security, I'd focus on a company like Mixterra. Great, thank you, Dave. The next question is on cybersecurity, which is very much in the news as of late. Are these companies more like software companies or do they represent something bigger, a larger conversation? Yeah, so so there's the there's the cyber ETF, CIBR. Uh, another one that you can look at is HACK, H-A-C-K. Um, both of them have pulled back certainly over the last two weeks, but into rising moving averages. Um, depending on the, the individual companies you look at, like Palo Alto um, is, let me just pull that up, PANW uh, has been about the best performer. Uh, uh, CrowdStrike has, a, has been another. It's pulled back a little bit off over the last short while. Um, there are lots of companies within the cyber ETF though that have really taken it on the chin. Again, it tends to be the companies that are more on the come. Maybe they've got newer technologies, but yet to generate a lot of cash flow that are under pressure right now. And one of the things to note is that a lot of the companies that have really been pounded over the last two to three weeks are companies that were quite crowded uh, by hedge fund investors. Uh, and some of them maybe have decided to take some profit and, and, uh, and there, there haven't been investors to step in behind them. So again, you, you have to pick your spots. The reason we like to own the leading company in the group is because it's not the first one to break down. It'll be the laggards or the ones with technology on the come to get hurt first when people lose some confidence. And, and that would tell us, for instance, in cybersecurity right now, we wouldn't add new exposure currently even though our companies are doing quite, quite well, um, we would wait to see breadth start to improve in the group before we started adding again. And you can see, as a result, our technology weight has slowly been coming down as the percent of stocks within the technology sector performing well has been deteriorating a little bit. Thank you, David. The final question for this afternoon is your view on the Canadian, do Canadian dollar to US dollar exchange rate over the next um, one to five years. Love your fee feedback on that and your perspective. Okay, so certainly um, Canadian dollar has been consolidating in the very short run. Uh, this is a five-year chart. Let's look at a much longer chart. Okay, so CAD was very weak during the commodity bear market. This would look a lot like the commodity ETF. Commodity ETF and the energy ETFs made turns last spring, like just as an example. If I were to pull it up, hold on. Oil, you know, oil was weak into the late part of last year. If I was to pull up the uh, energy producers ETF, you know, very similar sloppy period, right? And, and then over the last short while, we've seen some consolidation in energy. Uh, and we've seen some consolidation in the Canadian dollar. I think one year and five years from now, Canadian dollar is gonna be higher. Um, our view is that we've been going through a turn in commodity markets and the Canadian dollar is tightly tied to commodity prices. We've certainly seen a little bit of consolidation in, in, in materials prices. Now, some of them are making a turn back higher, so I wouldn't be surprised to see the CAD make a turn back higher. So if we are currently hedged back to Canadian dollars on almost all of our pooled holdings, 
because our view is the risk is that the Canadian dollar goes higher versus other currencies. Thank you, David. Well, that concludes the questions that we've received today for this evening's webcast. As always, Dave, I leave you with the final word. Well, look, for those uh, who are in the U.S. and going to uh, celebrate Thanksgiving this week, have a wonderful holiday with your families. Uh, for those of us who are here in Canada, it's getting cold. Wear your muffler. <laughs> and, uh, and I hope you get your Christmas shopping done early because I think that it's going to be hard to find some of the things out there. Uh, and uh, so for everybody else, uh, uh, let's, um, let's look forward to markets being firm through the end of the year. And, uh, and if they aren't and we need to do anything, we'll make whatever changes are required. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing you here again next week. Thanks very much for uh, tuning in. Thanks, David. Thanks, Pam.